Hi, I'm Darren, and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. Today's episode is part two of my series on building an amateur radio HF receiver. I'll walk through in detail my final circuit schematic, discuss many of the components that I selected and the reasons why I chose them, and show the results of performance simulations. As I said in the intro, this is the second video in a series that I'm planning on this project. The first I went through Jim Forkin's design as published in QST Magazine and shown online along with some of the changes that I'm planning to make and kept it pretty high level with block diagrams and, and other descriptions of the overall big picture I had in mind. Now I'm getting into the specifics. I'm going to be going through component selection and, and analyzing some of the circuit elements. So definitely diving down into the weeds. So bear with me because here we go. I've split the design into two major sections, each of which will be a printed circuit board that I'll make. Here's the schematic for the first one, which will contain the RF section up to the second mixer, along with the Arduino and control circuits. The second section will have all the audio processing in the AGC circuit, and I'll go through that one later. The first item on the signal flow path is the broadcast bandstop filter. I'm future-proofing my design for it, meaning I'm not putting the components directly on the board, but instead I'm putting in a connector header for a filter module to plug into. If I ultimately don't need it, then I'll just plug a jumper into the header instead. Next up is the RF preamp. I've made no changes to Jim's design choices here. Though I did run a simplified LT Spice simulation just out of curiosity, and the results look nice. Its 3 dB roll-off frequencies go from 340 kHz to 73 MHz, and in between it has a broad plateau of about 21 dB in gain. Of course, the actual gain response won't be this ideal. This is just a simple model after all. But nevertheless, this is pretty good from just a single stage 2N3904. Now for the monster topic, the bandpass filters. And this will take a while to explain what I decided to do here and how it's going to work. So you may want to settle in for my thesis. I'm going to go with swappable filter modules. I rejected the all SMT approach that Dave Brainerd used, mostly because it would have been very difficult to tune or alter the filter designs after construction, and I do expect there to be some experimentation and optimization of these filters. Plus, his data did show insertion losses that are greater than what I would expect to get from using toroid cores. I also decided to have room for more than one module at a time, so I could have at least two or more bands I could switch between on the fly without having to swap out a hardware module. I decided to support three modules, which I'm calling Bank 0, Bank 1, and Bank 2. So I'll need a way for the Arduino to select an individual bank, and I'm going to do it using these ultra-tiny Omron 6GHU signal relays from my junk box. They'll work very well here. One oddity about them, though, is their single-coil latching relays. That means you need to apply reversible 5 volts DC across the coil to get them to switch, but the upside is you can remove the 5 volts and they will stay in the state you put them in. That saves on power consumption, but it adds a bit more complexity to switch them. But as luck would have it, Analog Devices has an elegant solution. It's the MAX4820 Relay Driver IC. It has an SPI compatible interface, so I won't need dedicated digital I.O. pins from the Arduino. It drives the relays directly because it has low side MOSFETs and built-in flyback diode protection for them. And the icing on the cake is, AD has published an application guideline to show exactly how to use it to drive single coil latching relays. Pretty darn neat, huh? The knee-jerk solution for how to wire the relays would be to put one at each end of each bank for a total of six relays. When activated, the selected filter would then be connected between the RF preamp and the mixer. When deactivated, the filter would be grounded out to prevent parasitic coupling to the signal path. Using six relays in this fashion would require using two MAX4820 driver ICs because a single IC can only handle four latching relays. But after thinking about it, I discovered a way to make it work with just four relays and still ground out the unused filters. The way it works is, the first pair of contacts in relays 1 and 2 control the filter in bank 0. 
The second pair of contacts on those two relays control the signal path to relays 3 and 4, which handle banks 1 and 2. A downside to this approach is banks 1 and 2 must pass through 4 relay contacts instead of 2, so that adds a bit more signal loss. But these Omron relays do have precious metal contacts, so they should stay clean enough even with these low RF currents. No matter how I connect the relays, I must carefully sequence their switching. A consequence of this circuit is whenever an output pin is pulled low, it has to sync about 117 milliamps of current. The specs for the MAX4820 state that a single output is limited to 300 milliamps, so I'm okay there, but it can only sync a max of 150 milliamps total with all outputs turned on. So that means I must pulse the relays one coil at a time. But fortunately, per the relay specs, a 5 millisecond minimum pulse is all that's needed for state transition, so that's a big help. Here's my first stab at pseudocode for the switching sequence. I'm not going to bother to keep track in software of the relay states, so whenever a band change is requested, I'll set each of the four relays to their new correct state. So the data stream will look something like this table. Giving a generous 10 millisecond of energized time, which is twice the relay's spec, the entire sequence will take 70 milliseconds plus software and bus traffic time, which will be pretty fast, so let's say 80 milliseconds roughly to complete the whole sequence. That's acceptable to me. And if you were paying close attention to my schematic, you would have seen that I'm also feeding 12 volts DC to the relay contacts on top of the RF signal. The purpose for doing this is to add something called wetting current to the relays. Per the Omron specs, these precious metal contacts have a minimum permissible load of 10 microamps to keep the contacts clean. That's what these 10K and 4.7K resistors do. They put about 500 microamps through the contacts. The resistance values are high enough not to affect the impedance of the circuit, and having these 4.7K ohm and 0.1 microfarad caps here create a low-pass filter that will keep RF from feeding back into the power supply. I want to pause at this point and talk about other ways to switch these bandpass filters. You don't have to just use mechanical relays. In fact, you can use diodes, either pin diodes or fast uh, high-speed uh, switching dials like a 1N4148. In fact, I drew up a schematic using regular silicon diodes and compared it to my schematic for the switching relays, and they're almost the same complexity. The diodes do have a disadvantage, though. Their isolation from uh, circuit to circuit isn't quite as good as a open set of relay contacts, and there can be a little more insertion loss. So at the end of the day, I already had the relay, so I decided to go with that approach. I also looked at these non-contacting RF switches like PSIMI and other companies make, and those look very interesting. Now, they can be a little pricey, and it's a little tricky to find part numbers, I found, that will actually work well at HF frequencies. Most of them are rated for like, you know, 50 megahertz or 100 megahertz up into, you know, several gigahertz, and it's just not the best application for HF. So, I went with the relays, and we'll see how it works. I need to tell the Arduino which frequency filter is in which bank, and what I've decided to do here is drop the four-channel digital code scheme that I showed in my previous video in favor of a simple voltage divider that sends an analog signal to pins A0, A1, and A2. Doing this digitally needs four digital pins for a simple binary encoding, and as you'll see when I go through the proposed Arduino pin assignment table, I don't have enough available. Or I could add an I2C or SPI multiplexer, but doing the voltage divider is a lot simpler. Here's how it'll work. Each filter module will have six pins, two RF, two ground, and two that will complete a voltage divider. Two resistors on the module, along with a 470 ohm resistor on the main board, will make up the divider. This table shows how I parsed 5 volts into 12 equal sized bins of about 417 millivolts each, 10 bins for the 10 different filters I plan to support, plus diagnostic bins at each end to detect short the ground and short the VCC. Since the Arduino has a 10-bit A to D converter, its resolution of 4.8 millivolts across 417 millivolts gives me about 85 discernible steps per bin, so that's plenty of zone to work with. The 470 ohm resistor is necessary to provide short to ground protection for the 5 volts that I'm supplying to the filter module. I chose 470 because if a module has a direct short, the current will be limited to about 10 milliamps. I set the current through the voltage divider to about 1 milliamp for contact wetting purposes. So that's the only other parameter that I had to choose in order to calculate the exact values of R1 and R2 needed to generate the mid-range voltage values shown here. 
Next step was to choose standard values for R1 and R2 that are as close as possible to the exact calculated values, and in a first pass I was able to pick resistors from the E24 series that mostly work. I did a study in these columns for a worst case 5% tolerance stack up, and several of the bends do get uncomfortably close to the margins, so in my next pass I'll either go with 1% resistors, or just try different combos at slightly higher current to bring the voltages closer to design center. Of course, there will be some resistance in the connections that will skew the values a bit, but I'm not too concerned about that effect. There'd have to be at least 100 ohms of contact resistance to have any impact. And lastly, I only need to read this value one time at power on, so stability over time is not a big concern. So in the end, I'll have a receiver that supports switching between three different amateur bands while operating, with the ability to support more via an easy power down filter swap. And having three banks is a good choice because that maximizes the utility from one additional IC and four relays. Of course, I have to find room for all this hardware on the PC board, but I'll save that challenge for another day. Okay, moving on to the two mixers. Jim's design uses the Mini Circuits SBL1 or SRA1. I'm changing those to an SMT equivalent. The substitute must be a double balanced design and have the same plus 7 dBm local oscillator drive level. Next, I want similar bandwidth and a similar conversion loss. For the SBL1, those figures are 1 to 500 MHz and 5.6 dB. So with that, and along with seeing what parts are actually stocked by distribution, the choice narrows pretty quickly to the ADE2ASK. Other specs are close enough without making a science project out of this. The crystal filter will also be built with all SMT construction. 9 MHz SMT crystals are easy to find, but finding an SMT exact match for the obsolete BB204 through-hole Veracap diode is a bit more challenging. I did find the BB814, which should be close enough, judging by their capacitance versus reverse voltage curves when I overlay them. There's no changes to the IF stages other than integrating the feedback signal from the automatic gain control. Lastly, the audio section. Here I've integrated the AGC, the notch, and the audio power circuits pretty much verbatim to Jim's design. The only changes are some tweaks that I made to the LM386 audio amp circuit. I did investigate using dual audio amps instead of the LM386, specifically the more modern LM4880 for headphones and the LM4864 to drive the speaker. But in the end, that was going to add more complexity and I abandoned that idea. The tweaks I made to the LM386 were to adopt some low noise best practices, specifically driving the inverting input instead of the non-inverting input, and adding a base booster network that indirectly helps with hiss. I also added an RC series network to let me adjust the gain between 20 and 200 by just altering these values. I've set up Jim's automatic gain control circuit in LT Spice and simulated it. Now, I mainly did this out of curiosity. I sometimes do run LT Spice simulations on circuits that aren't clear to me, or if I want to play around with the values or components just to see what happens. Anyway, no surprises, the design works. What I've simulated is a 1 kHz audio signal that's AM modulated at a very low frequency, in this case 2 Hz. I wanted to see how fast the AGC would respond and then decay. I won't go through the circuit workings in detail, you can read Jim's article for that info. So just from a high level, everything to the left of this dotted line is the AGC portion, and this bit on the right is the portion of the IF amp that the AGC controls. I've included pots as specified and set them to values that maximize the response of the circuit. I also set capacitor C6 to an artificially low value so that the response will recover quickly and make it easier to see. Here I'm using the step command in LT Spice to control the AGC threshold pot from 20% to 80% and 10% steps. That way we can see how the circuit responds to progressively stronger input signals. The plot in the middle of the screen is the input signal to capacitor C2. It's hard to see, but there are seven different input signals here that increase in magnitude from 7 millivolts to 15 millivolts. The topmost plot shows what we're interested in. It's the seven different AGC voltage responses that correspond to each one of the input signals. So starting at the lowest level of signal, the AGC doesn't even respond. But as the signal gets progressively stronger, you can see a more aggressive AGC response, and eventually Q3, the PNP driver transistor, comes on saturated and the AGC voltage is clipped, and as the signal falls off, the AGC signal decays. 
In the full circuit, what will happen, of course, is the IF amp would be dialing back its gain, and the input to this circuit would be dynamically reduced, so we'd unlikely ever reach clipping. But that's a much more complex simulation that I'm not going to build. Well, you made it. Thanks for sticking with me to the end of this video. Now, I know it was a little dry. I spent the almost entire time going through a lot of the decision process and simulations and, you know, things that were really into the nitty gritty of the design. That was on purpose just to give kind of a small sample of the thought process that engineers like me, whether mechanical or electrical or whatnot, where we go through where we've got a list of demands, a list of constraints, and we can't find an ideal solution that's going to satisfy everything. So what do we do? Well, we probably prioritize which ones are the most important and we try to find more than one solution that can satisfy those and end up optimizing or, co or compromising at the end and picking the one that's going to give us the best balance. So that's what I hope I uh, achieved with this uh, video to give you that uh, that message. Now looking ahead at the, the next step, well I've got to package everything onto a circuit board and so this is what I uh, showed a little bit of earlier. It's 150 millimeters by 200 millimeters and Hopefully I'll be able to fit all the RF stages, the Arduino and its support uh, digital circuits and all the bandpass filters on there. So look for that in the next video where I'll be laying that out in KiCad and see if it does all fit. So until then, bye for now.